Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the third presidential lecture of the um, faculty of uh, Albert Einstein College of Medicine and Montefiore. So uh, this, is, this began with lectures by Joe uh, Sperano and John Candilis. And last year we had Bill Jacobs and Betsy Herald. And this year we are going to hear from Joan Berman and from Shinazo Cunningham. And uh, the, the history of this is that um, the Faculty Interactions Committee suggested this to the Dean and the President, uh, and they uh, took it up with glee. And so the people who go through the nominations and um, present the two people that we recommend for the Dean and the President to um, nominate um, are shown on the next slide. And so this is the Faculty Interactions Committee. Um, so we asked for nominations in January and uh, people can self-nominate, but also other people nominate. And we um, sent the names over at the end of February. And so it's always an exciting process. There were 16 nominees this year, very hard to choose every year, but today we're going to hear uh, two very nice talks that are quite complimentary. Um, and you will see what I mean when, when you hear them. So now I'm going to introduce President Safia, who will give welcoming remarks. It's usually too high for me. <laughs> It's like I'm disoriented. Um, Dr. Stanley, uh, thank you for being the person who drove us in this direction. It's become a, a really terrific uh, event, always interesting, and I want to remind you of what the goal was, which was that Montefiore and Einstein should become closer, and that this would be one way to do that. Um, the other way to do it is to become degree granting, and, uh, and we did accomplish that this past year. It took us just about three years. Um, who's competitive? It took Sinai six years. Uh, and, uh, it, it, uh, and we are, <laughs> we are fully a degree-granting institution uh, without a university. Uh, and that is unusual for this kind of uh, organization, but uh, it is uh, remarkable how important it was to us, and it has taken us to new, new places. Uh, I just want to add that uh, uh, Dr. Berman, I know, and uh, Dr. Dr. Chinazzo, <laughs> I know very well for a long time. They do, both do extraordinary work, and I think that this was a great pick to look at a uh, very important subject, and I know that we all look forward to it. So thank you very much. And Shay Gordon. Okay. So um, let me uh, echo my welcome to everybody. Uh, this is, as, as has been mentioned, the third of the presidential lecture series. And I think we hope that in many ways these serve as a catalyst to drive more collaboration across Montefiore Medicine, Einstein, and Montefiore Health System. And I think we really have a terrific example of the potential for that today. The platform is buprenorphine. The diseases are neurocognitive disease and HIV and opiate use disorders. And, and really, I think this is the kind of thing that we can excel at and we should excel at. And we have two outstanding faculty members today who are going to give us talks in this area. And uh, it's really my job and my pleasure to introduce each of them. And I'll start with Dr. Berman, since she's speaking first. And you guys have accomplished so much. I, I, don't, use, use to, I don't really like to use notes, but I can't keep things straight unless I, under these circumstances, do. So Dr. Berman's a graduate of Brown. She earned her master's and doctoral degrees at NYU and served as a postdoctoral fellow there. She is currently the Irving D. Karpus, Karpus MD Endowed Chair for Excellence in Medical Research at the College. 
She's an outstanding investigator, but in addition to that, she serves as a senior faculty advisor for Einstein's graduate division, the director of graduate student programming and experimental pathology, the co-chair of the medical student research committee, there's a theme here, um, and director of translational research for Einstein medical students. She also serves as the co-chair for Brown Women's Leadership Council Mentoring Committee and is a, a Pembroke Associate Council member. She's on the executive boards of the International Society of Neurovirology and the International Society of Neuroform Neuro Neuroimmune Pharmacology. You can see why I have to take, I have to use notes here. In 2012, she received the Women in Neuroscience Award and in 2013, she was recognized as the Einstein Basic Science Mentoring Award awardee for her contributions in mentoring Einstein faculty and their career development. She has several NIH-funded programs. Her laboratory examines the mechanisms that mediate entry of HIV into the central nervous system and how viral and inflammatory mediators damage neurons and other neuronal cells. A major aim is really translational research is in this translational research program is to enhance our understanding of mechanisms of neuroaids with the concept that we can identify new therapeutic targets. And she has a recent R01 that's going to, that addresses what she's going to talk to us about today. And the title of her talk is Buprenorphine, a Novel Therapy for HIV-Associated Neurocognitive Disorders. Dr. Berman, thank you. And I, before we start, I really just want to thank everyone for the opportunity to give this talk and to say I'm truly honored and privileged and especially to share it with Chinazo. Um, another important thing is my lab. The members of my lab, current and past, really, we're a team. This award is just as much theirs. Um, we love coming to work every day. It's, Einstein creates a wonderful environment, and my lab is an example of that, as well as my collaborators. So thank you to everybody, and I'm excited to share some of our work. So everybody knows that HIV infection is a major health concern worldwide. But what many people still don't realize is that cognitive deficits occur in a vast number of HIV-infected people. As illustrated in this 2009, a decade ago, article from New York Magazine, many, many HIV-infected people who are on successful antiretroviral therapies are now developing comorbidities that are usually associated with aging. And one of those is HIV-associated neurocognitive disorders. So what I'm going to talk to you about today are some of the mechanisms that mediate what we call HAND, HIV-associated neurocognitive disorders, the opioid epidemic that we all are very much aware of, and HIV infection, and how the impact of opioids has changed <coughs> HIV neuropathogenesis, and lastly, buprenorphine as a therapy for HAND. So the mechanisms that mediate HIV-associated neurocognition are very complex. Let me see where the pointer is. Ah, okay, so infected monocytes transmigrate from the peripheral blood into the CNS across the blood-brain barrier in response to low levels of chemokines, specifically CCL2. This is really to facilitate immune surveillance. So the infected cells enter, but once they're there, they release virus that can infect microglia, other macrophages, and to a low-level astrocytes, and this sets off an inflammatory response that causes the elaboration of host and neurotoxic factors that ultimately impact on neurons and kill them or damage them such that cognitive deficits emerge. What's really important to note is that neurons are not infected with HIV, but they are significantly impacted by all the processes that happen as a result of HIV infection. Also very important is that this process happens even in the presence of antiretroviral therapy. So when virus is suppressed and not replicating in cells, these infected cells will still cross the barrier, differentiate into macrophages, and serve as long-lived reservoirs. Macrophages can last for months, if not years, in the brain. And these reservoirs will result in inflammatory processes that keep on going and impact on neurons until finally cognitive deficits emerge. So the ultimate goal of our lab is to block this step. So what I didn't tell you about is the background on HIV neuropathogenesis, because I skipped it. So 40 to 70 percent of HIV-infected people develop HAND. And this happens despite antiretroviral therapy and despite viral loads. So no matter what the viral load is, even if it's fully suppressed, it doesn't matter. And what's 
Really surprising is that virus enters the brain within four to eight days of peripheral infection. So long before someone is aware that he or she is infected, unless you're a healthcare worker, and before anyone seeks help for antiretroviral therapy, the virus is fulminating in the brain and undergoing those processes that I just described. And it is mediated by the transmigration of monocytes across the blood-brain barrier, causing neuroinflammation and neuronal damage. And to date, there are no therapies and no purple biomarkers for hand. And I told you that CCL2 is a really important mediator of HIV neuropathogenesis. It's a very potent monocyte chemoattractant, and it's expressed in the CSF and CNS of the group of HIV-infected people, even in the presence of ART. So this underscores that the neuroinflammatory processes that are ongoing. Monocytes are also extremely important. They're key to neuropathogenesis. There are different subtypes of monocytes, and the one that we're particularly interested in is the mature monocyte that expresses CD14, which is the LPS co-receptor, and CD16, which is the FC gamma 3 receptor. In the healthy individual, in the PBMC, the number of these mature 14 positive, 16 positive monocytes is very low, 5 to 10 percent. But we and several other labs showed that this number is greatly increased in the peripheral blood of HIV-infected people. So people with HIV, despite suppressive art, have between 20 and 40 percent of this mature monocyte subset. We also showed that this subset is the cell type that becomes infected with HIV in addition to T cells. So N is the type, cell type that can cross into the brain. So now you have expanded in the peripheral blood of HIV-infected people the cell that is absolutely vulnerable to infection and that can cross the barrier. So these mediate the neuropathogenesis that we're going to talk about. But the number of mature monocytes in a healthy individual is very low. So how do you study this? Our lab developed a culture system in which we isolate from healthy PBMC the monocytes and we culture them non-adherently. Um, with MCSF, which is a monocyte activator, and then we go from about 5%, 14 positive, 16 positive cells, to about 90% mature monocytes. So now we have enough to study. We can also infect these cells in vitro with HIV, and then treat them with ART, specifically tenofovir and emtricitabine, which form the backbone of most antiretroviral therapies that people living with HIV are given. We also developed a tissue culture model of the blood-brain barrier so we could study how do these infected <coughs> cells enter the brain. The model consists of co-culturing uh, brain microvascular endothelial cells, human and human astrocytes, on a tissue culture insert that has three micron pores. So astrocytes can put their foot processes through, contact the endothelium, and form a tight barrier. We can put this in a tissue culture well on the bottom, which is the CNS side. We can put chemokine, and on the top are cells of interest, in this case, the infected, matured, and culture monocytes, but also PBMC from people living with HIV that I'll talk about later. Study their transmigration, collect the cells, quantify by flow cytometry, fax analysis, DNA, RNA, et cetera, to get a handle of what is the nature of the cells that cross this barrier. And what we showed is that the mature monocytes, even in the absence of infection, transmigrate across our blood-brain barrier very exuberantly to CCL2 compared to just meteor or baseline trafficking. But when the cells are HIV infected, there's much greater transmigration statistically significantly compared to the uninfected. So the question that immediately came to mind is, what these cells are heterogeneous, you know, in people, infection is heterogeneous, not every cell is infected. And in our tissue culture, cultured monocytes, not every cell is infected. So they're heterogeneous such that one, some of them harbor HIV, they're actually infected, and I'm going to call them HIV plot positive. And some of them have been exposed to virus, but they don't have the virus. So the question is, does either one of these cell types have a preferential opportunity to cross the blood-brain barrier? Obviously, if the infected cell preferentially crosses, that's going to continue the reseeding of viral reservoirs and this chronic inflammation and CNS damage. So we needed to know which cell type or neither is preferentially uh, transmigrating. 
And the way that we address this is using our blood-brain barrier, and we use something called droplet digital PCR. It's an extremely sensitive technique by which we can detect one HIV DNA molecule in a million cells. And so that's really important because people on suppressive heart do not, heart do not have fulminant replicating HIV. So we, what we do is we take the cells that were put on top of the co-culture, extract DNA, and the cells that transmigrated and extract DNA. And then we developed an enrichment factor by which we quantify the number of HIV DNA <coughs> copies per million cells post divided by pre. And what that basically tells you, if the number is greater than one, there was a real selection for the HIV infected cells, the ones carrying the virus. If it's less than one, the exposed cells preferentially, preferentially transmigrate. And if it's equal to one, there's no selection. So obviously, it's greater than one. I wouldn't be talking here. And so I will show you that on the next slide. So with this enrichment factor, we quantified the HIV DNA copies in the transmigrated cells. And it's between 2.8 and threefold more infected cells got into the brain than those we put on top. So this is a huge problem, because those cells have a selective advantage to enter the brain. All right, this is a model system. We know it's a really reliable model system, but what happens in people? So with Kathy Anastas and Anjali, we obtain PBMC from people living with HIV, put them on top of our blood-brain barrier, and quantify the same enrichment factor. And again, we can see that there's a 2.5-fold enrichment for DNA. What's really important to know, these people have been on suppressive heart for more than 15 years. So even in the presence of no viral replication in the periphery, those infected cells harboring latent HIV, it's not replicating, can gain access to the brain. We all know that in the brain, there are some blips of HIV replication, and CSF viral load doesn't match the peripheral viral load at all times, and these could be the source of that virus. It's really important to address this. We also showed using DNA RNA scope technology and confocal microscopy the cells that are transmigrating are monocytes. The cells that are carrying the virus across the barrier from these infected people who've been on art for 15 years are the monocytes. T cells are not enriched. They still have virus, but they're not enriched. They're not mediating this process. The monocyte is. So it's really exciting data because there are kind of two camps, the monocyte camp, the T cell camp. And this really underscored the importance of these monocytes in facilitating and enabling HIV neuropathogenesis to be ongoing and ultimately leading to cognitive deficits. So the importance of this finding is that even with fully suppressed viral replication, mature monocytes carrying virus still selectively enter the CNS, can replenish reservoirs, facilitate chronic neuroinflammation, contribute to neural damage and cognitive impairment. So what's the challenge? The challenge is to characterize interventional strategies to limit the entry of these monocytes into the CNS, therefore limiting viral reseeding, limiting chronic neuroinflammation, and hopefully reducing hand. It's a major focus of our laboratory, and I'm going to show, talk to you about one such therapy that we hope um, will work. We have an even greater challenge. HIV neuropathogenesis is made worse by substance abuse and specifically opioids. And as we all know, we are in the middle of an opioid epidemic. These are recent data from 2019. This is terrifying. It tells you that 11.4 people are misusing prescription opioids. Almost 900,000 people are injecting heroin. 2.1 million people have opioid use disorder. This is a huge problem, and then when you layer it on with HIV, it's really quite a challenge. So it is, there are data that show that opiate abusers tend to engage in risky behavior that can lead to HIV infection. HIV-infected people are often substance abusers, and they also are given prescription drugs for pain and could become addicted. So there's an interplay between the opioid epidemic and the HIV epidemic. So opioid abuse is really tightly linked to HIV. In the US, one in 23 women and one in 36 men who use IV drugs will contract HIV. That's a huge number. 
And the major drug of abuse is heroin, which is an opioid. And you can see very, no demographic is spared this opioid HIV interaction. The use of heroin is up regardless of gender, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic background, everybody, everyone, and whatever group you look at, opioid abuse, specifically heroin, is increased. Opioids are tightly linked to HIV CNS pathogenesis as they've been shown to exacerbate hand. And one of the ways that's been proposed that they do this is by mediating the functions of immune cells, of which the monocyte is my favorite, and, the C and CNS cells. Opioids mediate their effects through their receptors on the surface of cells, and both immune cells and CNS cells and monocytes express the opioid receptors. There were three such major classes, mu, kappa, and delta, and we demonstrated that mature monocytes express mu and kappa, regardless of if they were cultured in our laboratory or they come right out of people. So these cells can respond, and the very cells that are infected with HIV are targets for opioids. So there is something called opioid substitution therapy that Chinazo is going to talk more extensively about. It's used to treat opioid addiction. The two most common are buprenorphine and methadone. Opioid substitution therapies bind to the receptors and produce long-lasting effects, decreasing cravings and hopefully reducing or preventing withdrawal. The, the drug of choice that we're interested in is buprenorphine, specifically because early on some studies not with HIV-infected people but just in substance abuse suggested that buprenorphine improved cognitive function in um, opioid-dependent individuals as compared to those treated with methadone. So we chose to look at buprenorphine and perhaps how could we use it and what was it effect on the CNS because no one had really looked at those mechanisms. So buprenorphine is a partial agonist of mu and a total antagonist of core. It has increased safety characteristics due to that unique pharmacology, and it's effective at decreasing opioid dependence, and I think Dr. Cunningham is going to talk about how it improves HIV treatment outcomes. This is honestly something that's in Times Square, and you can get T-shirts and comic books, et cetera. It is encouraging um, opioid abusers to use buprenorphine or and to, to be able to stop HIV in its tracks. So our question was, what are the effects of buprenorphine on the many steps of CCL-mediated monocyte transmigration across the blood-brain barrier, remembering that those steps are key to HIV neuropathogenesis? So the first goal is to characterize this in vitro using brain microvascular endothelium, and the second is to use a mouse model of HIV that develops cognitive impairment. And, um, and we can study its monocytes as well. So one in vitro, one in vivo. So the steps that mediate CCL2 um, enhance transmigration of monocytes across the blood-brain barrier are multifactorial. There are many steps. They're complex. They're tightly orchestrated. So we decided to address some of these steps, the we being Matthias Hirogubari Bravo, who's a spectacular student in the lab. I'd like to also mention that um, Rosiris Rivera, Leon Rivera is the student, the MD-PhD student who is responsible for most of the other data. And as I mentioned before, everybody in the lab is amazing. So these steps are tightly orchestrated, and we try to parse them apart to determine where is buprenorphine mediating its effects, or will it mediate effects to reduce monocyte transmigration. So the first step that we looked at is called chemotaxis. The monocyte has to be attracted to the barrier before it can roll along it and go into the CNS. This is the blood, this is the blood side, and this is the CNS side. And so the monocyte, in presence of the chemokine, will be attracted, in this case, to CCL2. Matthias uh, developed a chemotaxis assay in which he put CCL2 on one side, the monocyte on the other side, and quantified how many monocytes respond to this chemokine, and does buprenorphine inhibit this chemotaxis? And what he showed is that CCL2, this is baseline, zero is baseline, one is baseline, and this is the CCL2-mediated chemotaxis. Buprenorphine significantly reduced this. So right away, the very first step that's necessary for monocytes to enter the brain is reduced in the presence of buprenorphine. This was a really good sign. 
So next, he looked at monocyte adhesion to the brain microvasculature. And this again is set to one for the control and uh, CCL2 caused firm adhesion of those monocytes to the endothelium and buprenorphine greatly reduced this. So the next step that's so important was reduced because the cells have to adhere tightly before they can move along the barrier and enter the brain parenchyma. Two proteins are involved in this type of binding. One is called ICAM and one is called VCAM. So Matthias said which cell type, which protein are the cells binding to and which one is affected by buprenorphine? Well, they're binding to both, but buprenorphine only affects the binding to ICAM. So this again is the adhesion assay. This is CCL2 it's binding, uh, mediated binding of monocytes. This is to the purified protein ICAM and then buprenorphine reduced this adhesion, but it had no effect on VCAM. So then the next question, where the money is, what happens with transmigration? Does buprenorphine affect the ability of monocytes to enter the CNS parenchyma? These studies were done by a new student in the lab, Daniela Murphy, and this is the part that we're interested in now. We've shown that we can limit chemotaxis, we can limit adhesion, but can we stop it from entering the brain? And these are preliminary data, hot off the press, and the answer is yes. This is an uninfected mature monocyte transmigration to CCL2 across the barrier with baseline set to one. This is buprenorphine treatment, it reduces it. Even more excitingly, it reduces infected cell transmigration. So when she infected the cells with HIV and then did transmigration in the presence of antiretroviral therapy, she found that yes, um, CCL2 mediates transmigration above baseline and art really, and buprenorphine really brings it down. And this happens even in the presence of antiretrovirals, which is really important because hopefully most people who are HIV positive are taking some form of, of art. So all of this worked in vitro, and it was really extremely exciting, but we needed a model in which to study it in vivo, and clearly we can't run to patients yet. So in collaboration with Dr. David Volsky's laboratory, we are now going to switch to a mouse model of HIV. Uh, Dr. Volsky is at Mount Sinai, <laughs> um, Icon School of Medicine, and this was done in collaboration with his lab, and especially with Dr. Jennifer Kelsenbach. So HIV doesn't infect mouse cells, in part because the envelope protein of the virus can't bind to any mouse cell to get in. So what Dr. Volsky and Dr. Potash did was they took the envelope protein from a mouse virus that can infect mice cells and swapped it out for the HIV envelope protein. So now this virus can infect mouse cells, and, but it replicates just like HIV. And so it's a mouse model, and more importantly, this animal develops cognitive deficits. And those deficits are problems in learning and memory, which are characteristic of people with hand as well. There's very low level viral replication in these mice, which is analogous to people who are in art. So this is a perfect model for us to study the effects of buprenorphine. So what we did first was we did a pretreatment of the mice with buprenorphine. So this would model a substance abuser who's on buprenorphine, who then becomes HIV positive. So these mice were given buprenorphine for three days prior to being infected with the virus. Then they were infected with eco-HIV, and then every day for four weeks, these mice were given daily injections of buprenorphine, just like people take buprenorphine every day. After four weeks, we then tested the mice for cognitive deficits using a water maze, and then we also took out their brains and analyzed their inflammatory monocytes. The goal was to correlate the monocytes with the cognitive deficits and determine if there was a relationship. And this is the water maze that was used. It's really complex. I think if I were a mouse, I'd have a lot of trouble with this. But it has six arms and a hidden platform with milky water so that the mouse can't see, with visual cues above all. So the mouse is given five tries, actually four tries, to swim to find the platform. And we record the errors and the time it takes for them to find it. Then we wait 30 minutes, and then the mouse tries again. In the last platform, it was trying to see if it has a retention. 
And then every day of testing, the platform location is changed to test the ability of mice to identify new spatial cues. And what I'm going to tell you is such exciting news. I want everyone to go, oh. Um, basically, buprenorphine inhibited the, cognitive, the ability of these mice to develop cognitive deficits. And that's shown on this slide. And these are, this was done in three separate independent experiments with a lot of mice. And what this shows basically, this is the HIV infect, echo HIV infected mouse. It doesn't really learn. You know, it keeps on trying to find and find, but it really makes a lot of errors and takes a lot of time to find the platform compared to the control that's in green. But the eco HIV mice pre-treated with buprenorphine looks just like controls. There's absolutely no cognitive deficits. We also tested the time to the platform, and that also was brought back to normal. So buprenorphine treatment eliminated cognitive deficits. So importantly, it did not impair vision or motivation. Because if the mouse couldn't find the platform because it was blinded, then it wouldn't be an experiment. It also was just as eager to, to swim as its controls. So that was not effective. Another possibility was that buprenorphine limited the HIV peripheral viral load, and that by limiting the viral load, it then didn't really go into the brain, and so you didn't have cognitive deficits, but it really had nothing to do with buprenorphine's effect on the brain. Luckily, that was not the case either, as the viral load in the eco-HIV spleens compared to the buprenorphine-treated eco-HIV mice was the same. So that wasn't the effect. So what about inflammatory monocytes? So we looked at them at two different time points. One was seven days in a separate experiment. That's acute infection. Because if you remember, I told you at the beginning of the talk that that window that the monocyte, the, the virus, gets into the brain is between four to eight days. So are we able to capture that window to reduce the inflammatory monocytes that enter the brain, likely carrying virus, so that the chronic inflammation that goes on is not as dramatic? And the answer is yes. And this was done by a very complicated and tour de force um, facts analysis done by Matthias. That I'm not going to give you the details, but this I will show you. In the eco HIV mice, 50% increase of inflammatory monocytes in the brain. In the eco HIV mouse treated with buprenorphine, it's significantly reduced way below baseline. This was really exciting because it said it's going to limit that chronic neuroinflammation that's tied to the cognitive deficits that didn't exist in these mice. We can't explain this result. Buprenorphine seemed to increase monocytes in the absence of any inflammatory process, but these mice were completely normal cognitively. So it says that buprenorphine does its best work in the context of inflammation, which is what our, our in vitro studies say, and now our in vivo as well. So what happens in a chronic setting? So after we did the water maze testing, we also looked at the monocytes, and this is really so low level, very con constant insult, but we could still see a difference. And that's shown here. There's a 15% increase in inflammatory monocytes in the brains of these mice, and it's brought way back down to baseline. So the importance of these findings is that buprenorphine may prevent and treat neuroinflammation and ongoing viral seeding associated with hand by limiting monocyte entry into the CNS, thereby improving cognitive functions in HIV-infected people. And this may be regardless of opioid abuse. So how do you feel about giving buprenorphine to people who are not opioid addicted? So uh, we have some suggestions to that. But first, in collaboration with Dr. Anastas and Dr. Sharma and Dr. Cunningham, we are going to isolate PBMC from three distinct groups of HIV, of people living with HIV. Those people, people taking buprenorphine and people taking prescription opioids. We're going to test their transmigration and determine if more monocytes transmigrate in the infected people and the opioid-taking people, and that's reduced with buprenorphine. Do we reduce the amount of virus entering the brain, and does this correlate with cognitive deficits? And then we're going to identify and examine monocyte proteins that are affected by buprenorphine as a potential therapeutic intervention using single-cell RNA sequencing. And here's the part that I think clinicians will feel better about. We're going to test small molecule analogs of buprenorphine for their ability to block monocyte entry into the CNS. So you can target with just a small molecule. You don't have to treat with the whole drug. 
And lastly, we're going to continue our studies with the eco HIV mice. So I want to thank you, but I want to acknowledge everyone who's contributed to this. Um, I think the phrase is, it takes a village. And I have an amazing one here in my dream team. Um, they are the best, most dynamic, and exciting group anyone would want to work with. And I will acknowledge specifically Rosiris and Matias and Lily and Tina and Aniela who worked on this project, but everyone contributes, everyone is part of the process. And my past lab members who also have worked diligently, starting with Clarissa and Diana and Loreto, who's here today, who actually started the Buprenorphine project and is now a faculty member of David Volsky's lab at Sinai, and Cheo, and of course, Mike Beanstra. I rest on the shoulders of many giants, and I would like to acknowledge the entire Volsky Laboratory, my other collaborators here, the pathology department, and Dr. Michael Prostowski, who's been really extraordinarily supportive and helpful with this, and my funding, for which I've been very lucky to get. So thank you all, and um, I look forward to hearing Chinazzo's talk. <laughs>